Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come this afternoon. As you can see from the title, uh, the main thrust of the talk uh, is going to be, or at least was going to be, the impact of uh, some of the changes, global changes we're going to see on our farmed and rural landscape, both what we can see and some things that we can't. Although I must say, having spent the last half hour in this room, I feel like I'm in the sort of a meeting of, I don't know, small energy providers anonymous. There seems to be a lot of sharing of grief and stories going on at the moment. And um, I will, uh, I am currently in the midst of making a panorama about the current energy uh, uh, crisis, if you like, furore, turmoil, however you want to call it. Um, so I'm fairly involved in that. And certainly when it comes to questions at the end, very happy to take uh, questions on that or any other matter. The global population growth. 9.6, 10, maybe 10 and a half billion is a lot of people, no doubt about it. And um, I, the world population has probably more than doubled in, in my lifetime. So big changes, big stress on uh, food production in particular. I mentioned uh, climate change. This is uh, a map showing where climate change, where the changes in temperature will be at their steepest. Perhaps no surprises there to people who follow this in detail. The poles are actually where it's at its steepest. Uh, areas um, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the tropics, it's quite steep as well. Interestingly, as you can see from this, one of the areas that is least affected by climate change in the short term is Britain, because we're quite well protected by the Atlantic as much as anything else. And there have been other studies which have shown in the bulk of the country... Uh, possibly with the exception of the south, the far southeast of England, it's sort of either 50-50 in terms of crop production or, could a or food production, I should say, or could actually be slightly beneficial. Now, I should stress I am not saying that climate change is a good thing and something to be welcomed. However, it does impact different areas of the world differently, and Britain is one of the areas that might not do that badly. Growing more. Do we have a duty to grow more? Is it a necessity or is it a business opportunity? So I actually I think I'll take those from the, 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 the bottom up, really. A business opportunity is saying um, look, we know quite a lot about growing food in this country. There's a growing appetite throughout the world. We should be able to sell a lot out there. And um, the uh, changes brought about by climate change that I, meant, uh, that I mentioned earlier might mean we are relatively strengthened in our position. Duty... That's a sort of global responsibility question. It's unlikely that we're going to be the ones that are going to starve or go hungry if, if, if food resources get really short in the world. We're, even in 2050, we're likely to be in the top half, if not top third, of, of wealth in the world. But as somewhere that can grow food and has a relatively benign um, climate and soil, and we have the knowledge, we have the investment... Should we be doing it? Should we be stepping up to the plate and saying, hang on a minute, we should be doing our bit to produce what we can so there's less pressure on other parts of the world? Unlike, possibly not everything else in our lives, unlike an awful lot of things in our lives, we absolutely hate, the, we appear to hate the idea of science or innovation or novelty or ingenuity is an ingredient. As shoppers, we seem to want it to have come from the bounty of nature, the less humankind has had to do with it, the better, seems to be our view. If you look at the marketing, the way supermarkets, brands, anybody advertises their food, it's always about nature and about it being natural. Now, I'm not... I'd, I'd actually quite like to do a sort of... If I had my time and did a PhD, I'd quite like to examine why this is the case. I suspect it might be something to do with no, so much novelty and and fast-moving and non-physical things in, other part of our li in other, most of our lives, we're sort of clinging to one bit that seems certain and unchanging, and it's a sort of bedrock feeling. Because if this... I don't know what it is, actually. Is it, a squat? Is it some sort of courgette, marrow-type thing? If that were discovered growing up a mountain in Chile... Everyone and, you know, had some great property of, of curing cancer or making us all look ten years younger. We'd think it was the most fabulous thing ever and if it would fly off the shelves. If exactly the same thing was produced by this guy, we'd all be suspicious of it. People would be suspicious, you know, why is that? How have we got to that position? And is it tenable as we 
go forward to sort of thinking how we are going to produce more food off the same, if less, land, do we not have to uh, engage more with science? Now, this isn't particularly an argument about GM, because as yet, GM isn't, or rather hasn't, produced... The, 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 despite the claims of some of the uh, biotech manufacturers, there isn't actually particularly a product that they could go out there and plant in Britain, which is genetically modified, which would produce more. Most of them, maize is the closest, but actually Britain isn't a great environment for growing maize. Still a bit too cold, a bit too wet, a uh, bit too cold, sorry. I think it's a very interesting debate, which we will see more of, and will clearly affect the uh, countryside around you. There is, there are, I should say, quite a few organisations who are managing to do both who are managing to produce a lot of food and maintain the environment. I'll just give just a couple there. Uh, the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust and LEAF, which stands for linking environment and farming. These are organisations who are both dedicated, who, who are dedicated to both producing a lot of food and maintaining a, a, high, wildlife, um, uh, a high wildlife farm. Or, and they do it very well. I mean, Game Wildlife Conservation Trust has, as, as I, I don't know, three or four prop properties. And what's interesting there, and controversial in its own right, is, as you can see from the word game, it's actually about the, the, the motive which makes them create a habitat which is good for wildlife is because some people want to come in and kill it. But only by providing enough for people to kill do you provide an environment where lots of other, there's lots of collateral benefit in terms of other things as well. Once again, a tricky ethical question. Personally, I've never uh, shot anything in my life, but I I think if the collateral benefit is what I've suggested, I think that could be a price, price worth paying. As I say, not my bag, but I don't particularly object to it. Leaf, people are members of the linking environment and farming and, uh, and a number of farms, uh, hundreds around the country are part of this. One of the suggestions of what we should do with farming is produce more from the areas that are highly productive and let some of the other areas go wild. There's this thing of... Um, the question of whether, whether you should... Uh, sparing or sharing, it's called. Sharing is kind of what I've just talked about in terms of leaf and, and the other things. Uh, sparing is you leave some areas to go wild, large areas here and to the west of here, <laughs> and the others you, you're banging in your agricultural productivity into there. So in case you think this is only a thing that can happen in, uh, in less populated areas, large chunks, I'm not proportionate to the whole country, but of the Holland, which is also very densely populated, very uh, agriculturally productive, very inventive country, they're doing a lot of rewilding there as well. So if anybody wants to ask anything about this, or anything else, or anything else you want, please feel welcome. <laughs>